Hello. Today I chat with Dean Falk, and Dean is a professor of anthropology and evolutionary anthropology. You can think of it as like, there's another term for it, which is like paleoanthropology. It's essentially what was going on between chimps and the start of humans, you know? And so, you know, from like 7 million years ago through, um, you know, 200,000 years ago, the start of Homo sapiens. So that's what we chat a lot about. And we're trying, and Dean, it's amazing because she knows so much more about this than obviously the rest of us do. And so she gives this really cool perspective on um, how language began and also what was happening before stone tools and things like that. And also she gives this really cool perspective on the kind of biases that we have in trying to understand our past. And these biases are both from a male versus female perspective in terms of men being like, oh, we were all tool making, blah, blah. But then like women paleoanthropologists and we're like, well, what about the kids? And like, wasn't that a crucial piece of stuff? And like, what about motherese and like talking, you know, mom to kid? And wasn't that a crucial thing? And so, so we talk a lot about these kind of biases and um, what those show and how we can use those biases or, or examine those biases to actually understand how humans evolved and how we are different than apes and the role of language and the role of tools and all of that. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Dean. I learned a lot and uh, thank you. Bye. Hello, fellow pluralists. My name is Reese. I'm the co-founder of Root and welcome to The Reese Show. This century is a turning point in human history and I'm here to help you navigate it. I hope you come away with a new understanding of the scientific, technological, and societal trends that are poised to radically reshape our world, and how you can work with those trends to became, become a live player in building a solar punk future. And to understand the kind of big history of those trends, uh, today I'm excited to chat with Dean Falk. Dean is an American evolutionary anthropologist whose work focuses on the evolution of the human brain and the associated emergence of language, music, art, and science. She's the Hale G. Smith Professor of Anthropology and a Distinguished Research Professor at Florida State University. Dean, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, excited to chat. And 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 Dean is, you know, a person, you know, for me as kind of a, you know, a millennial who is trying to, who's a computer science major, who's trying to understand like the big history of humanity. Um, I've been reading uh, various books and various people about like the origin of homo sapiens and stuff like that. And Dean is this amazing person who's been working in that field for a while. And so today we're just going to kind of, you know, the goal for us and for the listeners is to really understand Dean's perspective on how homo sapiens came to be and how language began. And so with that, Dean, maybe I want to ask you from an outsider perspective here, it's like, you know, there's a lot of different pieces of understanding early sapiens um, and early homo sapiens. Could you tell me like which part of that you like most focus on and like some of the research you've done there? Right. I actually focus on the ancestors of homo sapiens even yeah. earlier. So I want to look at how the lineage that eventually gave rise to people, how it originated out of ape-like stock. Because as I'm sure you know, People share a common ancestor with our closest non-human cousins, chimpanzees, that lived five to seven million years ago. So what I'm interested in is what happened after they split and our ancestors shifted eventually from living most of the time in trees to eventually living all of the time on the ground. So. I begin, I'm trying to begin at the beginning, and um, actually I've done a lot of work in the middle, about two to three million years ago, looking at fossils uh, ancestral that are ancestral to hominins, our, our group. Love it. Yeah, and, no, that's great. And the reason I ended up in the middle is because there are very few fossils before then. You have to use other methods to ask these questions. So I did a lot of work looking at skulls and the brain cases of skulls and the imprints that the brain has left inside the brain cases of the skulls. Yeah, tell us about, because that's a really interesting part about you know, trying to understand various points in history. It's like if we're going way back to the Big Bang, we can kind of do some, I don't know, physics stuff and like roll back the clock and do things. Yeah. Or if we're trying to understand like, you know, the world 100 years ago, we can like look at what people were writing then. But for someone like you, 
tell us more about like how you determine when you're trying to answer these questions about what was happening with Australopithecus and like early, you know, you know, between chimps and sapiens. How do you you're looking at skulls and you're looking at the, how the brains change the skulls or tell me more about that? Right. Well, um, you get skulls, you know, maybe the oldest 3.5, 4 million years ago that are informative. And one way to ask those questions is to study the cast of the interior of the brain case. They're called endocranial cast or endocast. And with luck, you know, some of these actually look like brains to some extent and reflect or reproduce some of the shape of the outside part of the brain or the cerebral cortex. And a certain amount is known about the functions of the cerebral cortex, uh, different parts of it. So one tries to interpret, if possible, some functional kinds of things that were going on. For instance, language is a biggie. And one can see on human brains um, a pattern of grooves and bumps or convolutions, which is uh, reflects language. And it's derived, it's um, different than the patterns you see in other primates. And you can look at functional imaging studies and uh, to, to help one interpret what you're seeing. So you can do a certain amount of that, and you can see for sure from skulls, you can see the evolution of brain size over time. That's easy. Just fill it up and see what the volume is of the brain case. And that's a fair approximation, not perfect, but a fair approximation of brain size. So if you do that from three and a half million years and come up to the present, you're going to see brain size increasing, well, up to Neanderthals anyway. Then it levels off. So you can do brain size. You can do a certain amount of function, although that's just controversial bitter mm. fights over how do we interpret such and such a groove. I mean, classic uh, fights. So you can do a certain amount of that. And I've done um, probably more than I, <laughs> than I wanted to in terms of those kinds of studies. You can look at right-left differences, ask the question, is the brain lopsided in any way? Which is an advanced trait, by the way. So you can do that. And, uh, but there are other methods and you have to use other methods if you go older because there's not much of a fossil record. Yeah, and interesting. So, yeah. It's, so it sounds like, yeah, I mean, A, that's, yeah, it's like the classic thing is super easy where you're just like, oh, the brain is this big. It's like, okay, we went from, you know, 400 cc's or whatever. And I, I might get these numbers, you know, slightly wrong, but like good. from 400 cc's to like 1500 with Neanderthals and then, you know, sapiens have like yeah. 1200 or whatever. And so mm -hmm. I think there's a... Um, uh, so that is all that makes sense. And, and tell me about when you think about that. And, and then there's this other piece of like, okay, and you can like look at these little grooves. And I just love imagining a bunch of like, you know, paleo anthropologists or whatever, who are kind of like <laughs> looking at the grooves all in a room and going like, well, I think this groove is, um, it's, uh, <laughs> is, it, is it kind of like that? or what oh, like? Well, actually, that's putting it politely. <laughs> Now, yeah, people are getting these, angry. These debates over these grooves have at times become very emotional, and in public settings, yes. Um, oh man, at like the at like the paleoanthropologist like oh, convention yeah. or whatever. Oh yeah. Did oh, you yeah. ever? Did you ever? Were you ever like on? Were you ever in one of those intense like fights or whatever? Oh, I uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have been, and I think I still am. Uh yes. I have been in a rather heated, prolonged, at least four decades long discussion focusing on one groove. <laughs> one groove that apes have and monkeys have is called the lunate sulcus. And there's a debate about the extent to which people have this. And a lot of uh, inference has been put on, on this sulcus since, oh, the early 1900s. And it's been, I mean, it's sort of been ludicrous, the extent to which the field has entertained this debate. But, but it still goes on. I, I became somewhat weary of it. And I sort of feel like, well, I've said more or less all I have to say about the, 
Moon ain't sulcus. Uh, but yes. That's amazing. That's hilarious. That's a, yeah, it's like you're in on it, you're in it. And then eventually you're like, you know what? I'm done. Uh, you know, I've, yeah, you've, yeah, you've said yeah. all you can say. Um, yeah. So is there a, so when we think about, um, I guess when, when, when we think about that, that time period of, you know, and for our listeners as a note there, yeah, like the chimps are around, you know, you know, five to 7 million years ago and then sapiens, depending on where you count or whatever, 200,000, 300,000 years right. ago. Um, and so that in between period, there's first this crew of the, they're called Australopithecus, which is like, um, these folks who are, um, they are on hind legs, I guess, is the main, uh, difference between them and the chimps, um, okay, bipedalism versus not. And then once we get to homo, then that gets this thing of like tool use and, um, brain size, especially it's like, the, as far as I can tell the main differentiator, is that yeah. right? Um, Australopithecines, which they're kind of generically called, these very early hominins, um, likely had um, some primitive tools. Yeah. But they, there's not a fossil record of tools until it picks up, uh, depending on what one accepts, at yeah. the earliest would be 3.5 million years. Before that, certainly hominins would have been using tools because the great apes do particularly chimps and orangutans and to much lesser extent gorillas. But chimps are our closest, genetically closest cousins. So one can presume that the very earliest hominids after the split were already using particularly wooden kinds of tools and maybe bashing things with stones. There's no indication that they were bashing the stones to make finer tools. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between picking up a rock to clunk something um, and picking up a rock and battering it with either another rock or bones to shape it into a, you know, a deliberately made stone tool that you start seeing um, 3.5 million years ago at the earliest, but before yeah. then there would have been tools and you hit on something really important that probably was key. You know, there's a question, why did you get that split? between the ancestors of living chimps and the ancestors of us yeah. five to seven million years ago. And most paleoanthropologists think it had something to do with natural selection for more and more walking on two legs on the ground. Not that they got up and walked overnight, you know, overnight, hey, I'm bipedal now. Yeah. I see it as a really probably slowly evolving process during those first three million years, which are the dark ages, you don't get a lot of discussion at that time for good reason. You don't have much of an archaeological or a fossil record. This but, is like four million to seven, four million to seven million yeah, years ago. Roughly. And, and, and the four million year old stuff's equivocal and you know, uh -huh, um, yeah, but before then, but that doesn't mean a lot wasn't happening. And I think a lot was. And, and that's where I'm kind of focused right now, asking that question, well, what, you know, why did that split happen? And then what happened to our lineage? And bipedalism was the key, I think, to setting it off. And the key to why, you know, why did you get bipedalism was, I think, that um, our ancestors came out of the trees. You know, they were sleeping in trees for a long time, but spending a lot of time in trees. But the climate changed and trees started to disappear. And that may have been part of the, you know, what enabled or facilitated the eventual shift to ground living. So, but then I think there was a whole cascade of events that began with bipedalism. It was like dominoes. It was serendipitous, but it was like dominoes. And, um, and I'm interested in this because it's a blank, you know, there's just not much that's been done on this and it was important. And I think if we look there, we can actually learn more about the recent stuff. Yeah. You know, cool. our origins. That's great. No, I love that. I think, well, Hey, as a side note, yeah, there's a funny part of, um, 
for me again as an outsider to like anthropology and like it's or you know paleo you know paleo anthropology you have these everybody's kind of battling over like oh when is the oh this homo sapiens thing was you know 200,000 oh now we've seen it as 300,000 years ago but then there's also this funny thing where you're like okay did fire you know there's kind of some aspects of fire maybe two million years ago but yeah. then there's this other one oh wait maybe one million years ago oh but it's really yeah. 125,000 yeah. years ago that it was systematic and so right. the tools is another funny thing when you look at early tools you're like that's just a rock you know exactly. <laughs> so what's a exactly. rock versus what's a tool is a, yeah. a, just a yeah. funny thing and, and they've been glorified i mean there are um archaeologists cognitive archaeologists who actually will point to certain tool traditions, stone tool traditions, for instance, the Ashelian a couple million years ago, and say, aha, this is where you have the cognitive leap that led to the smartness in our lineage. And so a lot of uh, a lot is placed on stone tools and how nice they were and sophisticated as if they are the bill weather and uh, to indicate intelligence. And um, I actually think they were pretty late in the game and that this has been um, a bias. Mm. And might I add, implicit in that and sometimes explicit is, well, hmm, who made these wonderful, highly advanced tools that required a leap in intelligence? It wasn't the females. <laughs> So there is, and, and even though now people go out of their way to kind of put in a Hosanna and go, oh, yeah, well, maybe females were making some. But really, it's been kind of written for a long time. The, um, the assumption's been males make tools. Well, why? They need them to hunt and, and uh, bash each other over the head. And so there's been that bias in a lot of different ways, but particularly in stone tools. And I think, well, you know, what's evolution about? Well, it's about reproductive fitness, which means, you know, passing genes into the future. And which sex has a particularly large responsibility in doing that? And we're talking before marriage. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> was yeah. Acknowledged. We're talking before there was any cognizance about um, where babies came from. Yeah. And you know, we did know they came from mothers. <laughs> and uh, so it was um, mothers and, and infants were, <clears throat> were a really important focus, I think, target for potential natural selection. Yeah, that's great. I think that there's, I mean, an interesting piece of that is that there's a, yeah, there's like kind of two biases at play here. The first one, the one that you noticed, just like, yeah, you had, and especially traditionally within science stuff, it's like, oh, here's all these like random, you know, and, and, and both dudes and then also like white dudes in Europe. That was the thing that I learned recently about yeah, like yeah. the out of African theory. It's like, oh, we used to think that everything was happening with the crow magnons in Europe and oh, like yeah. Europe is where oh, yeah. everything was. Oh, and it's like, oh, wait, that's just like where we were looking for stuff. And it turns yeah. out that like all the smart stuff was happening, you know, uh, before that in Africa. So there's right. one side, which is like the white male European bias. And then the other side is just like, what you can get out which is like a stone tool is a thing that just like is easier to look at you're like okay it's this rock this looks like it probably was a stone tool or whatever versus some of these more difficult things perhaps of like uh, like the like how so tell me more about like i guess there's two places i want to go here one of them is like on the like the the woman side and how women like the role of women and that like what was happening there yeah. as opposed to stone tools. Maybe let's go there first. And then after that, I want to go to like what your current explorations into the like dark period between four and 7 million years ago. Actually, to answer that, we will go into that dark period. Nice. Great. Okay. Um, and this is, you know, what I've been working on now pretty hard for a couple of years um, because I'm very interested in, you know, what happened after the split on up to when you, to the point where you begin to get stone tools and we call the time after that, on up to a mere 3,000 years ago, the Stone Age. And so the textbooks are all kind of zeroing in on the Stone Age. Well, I'm uh, audaciously naming a different age uh, from the division on up to the beginning of the Stone Age, the Botanic Age, as in botanical. And I think the place to begin is if you look at great apes, they do, which are chimps, gorillas, and orangutans, 
they do something, a couple of things that no, none of the hundreds of species of monkeys do. These are drives or advanced things that they invented or evolved, one of which is at the end of the day, each ape is up in a tree and it builds itself, it weaves together a big bird's nest. I mean, it looks like a bird's nest, a big sleeping nest where it will sleep safely up in the trees. <clears throat> and these can be very complicated. They require taking branches and leaves and making a big bowl shape and then weaving and then putting leaves in and patting them down and maybe getting in and pulling more leaves down. These are, uh, this is where our beds came from. Yeah, the our original beds bed. <laughs> have just come out of the trees and onto the ground, right? But these were maybe the first kind of tool that we see in the, you know, common ancestor. They are derived, advanced in apes. And a certain amount of cognition, there are people that actually study tree nests. They get up there and they climb in them and they get hairs out of them. They do DNA analysis and they reverse engineer them. But these were advanced tools. And once hominids started to shift out of the trees onto the ground, then they started to make their sleeping nests on the ground. There are a bunch of problems to do with predators. But the nest shifted to the ground and their wood, essentially, their botanical material. And eventually, um, and, and, so, and females with their infants may have been part of the drivers to the shift because with selection for walking on two legs, something that happened was, well, the feet change. Actually, the whole body changed, but it was sort of from the ground up. So the feet went first. And babies and, and adults too, the feet no longer were grasped, were like hands no more. They became weight bearing instruments and lost the fine grasping ability. So if you look back at apes, and now we'll throw in all the hundreds of species of monkeys, their babies shortly after birth, because they essentially have four hands, cling to their mother's ventrum, to their mother's bellies with all four, you know, with the two feet and two hands. And mom can go about her business up in the trees, on the ground, whatever, bounce along, and the baby is just glommed on, happy as a clam in high water. When hominids became bipedal, babies lost the pedal grasping and I think for reasons to, uh, to do with primatology that they uh, no longer could sustain clinging to their mothers. What are the mothers doing? Well, what apes do during the day, um, they get up, get out of their trees and go foraging, take treks. And mothers have to take their nursing infants with them. And uh, those nursing infants could no longer glom on. So mom had a problem. So the baby, actually. Mom had a problem. And I think that a way it was addressed was already there was the, the, um, the ability and the cognition to weave together tree nests at night to keep these big-bodied great apes from going plop, weight, you know, anti-gravity tools. I think taking those weaving abilities – getting some vines and twigs, and making a little sleeping nest that mom can wear, baby slings. I think baby slings were real early and derived from tree nests. And, that, and then a lot of other wood, uh, wood tools came out of this. Um, great apes have a certain amount of folk physics, intuitive physics. They understand intuitively, as we do. We have a certain amount of folk physics we're not even aware of. If you go for a walk and there's a puddle and you step over it, you're using physics, an intuitive understanding to know how to step over it. Um, so I think that um, this, this knowledge from arboreal treeness and making them transferred to making other botanic tools. And then you can bring that forward in time and you can trace wooden tools and um, uh, fiber arts on up to the present. 
And, you know, like the first wheel was wood. The first boats were, you know, canoes, dugout canoes, and ships were wood. And so I call this the botanic age. And I think a key to it were these mothers and their infants because they were a, a magnet for severe natural selection. If mothers couldn't keep their babies safely with them, they die, the genes the babies would die, the genes are gone from the future, the mother might die, the genes are gone from the future. So I think that they were, you know, very important at this early stage and that they adapted. They need not have, I mean, I think it could have been close, but uh, whether or not we would exist today, but they adapted. They found ways around that other than just, you know, making a baby sling and gluing the baby to you, um, the whole dynamic communication between mothers and infants, I think was affected by the fact that they no longer were 24 seven glued together. Mm -hmm. And that um, from that new kinds of communication forms of communication, gestural and vocal were selected between mothers and infants. Yeah, that's great. I think there's a lot of, I mean, amazing, juicy stuff in there. It's like, it does, it is so funny when we just have these like terms of like, okay, this is the, we got the stone age, you know, and that's going to be all the thing. And so that's what's all about stone tools, you know, yeah. um, from, you know, yeah, again, depending on how you count 4 million or 2.5 million through like, you know, the start of writing or whatever. And I think there's a, um, th so that is, and then you're like, okay, so what happened? It is funny because it's like, yeah, we don't, you know, thinking about like what the folks were doing before that is interesting. And I think all of the things, obviously, you know, the stuff that you say makes sense there. And you can kind of see these as like convergently evolved things within human populations over time, where it's like humans today, um, human mothers have to bring their babies with them and they have strollers or they sometimes have little backpacks that they do. Or, you know, like 200 years ago, they, I'm imagining like, you know, they have like a little sling that you like, you like yeah. put the baby in the cloth thing and it like brings the yeah. baby with you. Um, and you, there's stuff that you can, places where you can put the baby, maybe if you need like a crib or whatever, like you can hang out there and like, I'm going to go do something and I'll be back. Um, and so like knowing that, yeah, early um, hominids or early, you know, these um, australopithecines uh, had uh, did something similar. That makes a lot of sense. Is there, so then, and then also that the connection between the uh, tree nests, the like, you know, baby slings, and then like the connection to, to that, to like other forms of tools make some sense. How do you think about, so, so like, I guess, um, how would I ask this? How would you know if this was true or not true, given that tools, that wooden tools and like these baby nests might not exist, you know? Right. Well, we're hoping for the time machine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the only way one can prove this. Um, you can, I mean, these are really uh, hypotheses. Yeah. And so what you look for are more and more finds. And then you look for, um, and periodically we get them. And so things change, like everything gets older. As you noted, some think Homo sapiens is 300,000 years old. Well, that's way older than it was two years ago. Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, so these things keep hap happening. But um, you can uh, look for evidence by looking at uh People around the world that live in small scale, non industrialized societies who have a hunting and gathering way of life that more closely resembles our ancestors' way of life and um, see how they live. It, there's evidence there that can be very informative. You can do comparative studies by looking at chimps and, if you want, other great apes and comparing them to contemporary people around the world in all kinds of societies. So you can get converging evidence. You can, a very powerful tool, is do uh, what's called evolutionary developmental biology or EVO, DEVO studies, where you compare the development starting prenatally, you know, and start in the womb, compare different species and how they develop up through birth and then early years on up through life and see what kinds of information you can get there. If you're interested in language, you can um, study linguistics and anthropological linguistics and psycholinguistics and bring all this information together and see if any of it gels into 
patterns. Cool, cool. Yeah, that's interesting. It's like, yeah, and that that makes sense. And it's kind of like a, um, yeah, there's kind of like the simplified form of the way we used to do this, which is like, oh, how big was the skull, you know? And you're like, okay, the skull was this big. Great. That's what we know yeah. about the the past. Um, and then now we're like, oh, there's a, a stone tool here. Um, great. That's when stone tools started. Yeah. Um, that versus this kind of like multi uh, modal way of like kind of understanding and, and doing the yeah. science there. So tell and, me. And, okay. Mm-hmm. okay well, another thing you can do is um, you can look at your own experience, say, if you're a parent um, and recall back when your infant was born, depending how old it is now, and think about the stages it went through and what you did. Chances are, um, when you were talking about, you know, you have ba- you have infant carriers today and play pins and et cetera, but children don't. They're very study set addresses. They really often don't like it when you put them down. <laughs> and ask yourself, well, what did you do when your baby was little and you put it down and it started to cry? What did you do? Well, one thing you might have done was um, make soothing noises Mm -hmm. or hushing noises or sweet talked or baby talked to that Mm -hmm. baby. And um, psycholinguists, there, there are a lot of studies that show that your infant's acquisition of language, you know, the baby wasn't born with a language. At the end of the year, it's getting it, and a whole lot's happening to its brain in between uh, those times. A a very important thing that's happening is it's hearing baby talk or mother ease, and that's really a bootstrap for infants acquiring their native languages. So if you think about all that, then you can say, well, what about evolution? Only people have baby talk. No great ape, no monkey. They'll make contact noises. You know, they'll communicate a little bit, but only humans, the moment the baby's born, the parents turn to it and they can't help themselves. It's instinctive and go into heavy duty motherese, which is a very special register, very special way of talking. Slow and melodic and emphatic. And that is a, um, that is, a bootstrap for language acquisition. Parents don't know that. It also expresses emotion. It can be used uh, to teach baby things, that kind of thing. But an underlying really important factor is language acquisition. That had to evolve. It had to emerge. So you can ask yourself, what would be reasonable hypotheses about the circumstances under which this might have started to emerge? Yeah, Those are the that- kinds of tools. That's great. No, I mean, I think that that one is interesting. Yeah, you can you can kind of, and that's kind of, yeah, I think that 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 frame is helpful. Yeah, it's like this yeah, a necessary part of any chimp or human's life. Or you can like, you can be like, oh, that thing has to occur there. So therefore it must have occurred in the past. Yeah. Or, you know, so, so yeah. do you, let's talk about language for a second then, which is, it's funny when you look at, so, so, you know, the context here is like, you know, I'm, I'm writing this big history book about, you know, from the Big Bang and how like, you know, genes were replicated to, you know, the start of life and genes replicated to create the tree of life. And then now we have these, you know, in the Dawkins sense, these memes, um, you know, these ideas that are flowing from mind to mind that then replicated to create the tree of ideas and all of technology and stuff. And so and so as part of that, I'm trying to be like, OK, so so obviously a huge piece of that is that we got. Um, language with these phonemes and these, you know, a bunch of different phonemes that could be connected to each other to create to, to, to create any, anything. And then later, those phonemes turn into letters that then A through Z, yeah. you know, could create anything. Um, but at the beginning, there are these weird things about like, okay, we were starting to do some like imitation stuff where we were just like imitating with each other. And then when you look on Wikipedia and you're like, how did language start and there's like there's like 15 different um um, things that are all like maybe it was like this or maybe it was like this so could you tell me more in us for me and the listeners like how did language how do you think language started and what how did imitation how was it connected to imitation yeah yeah Yeah. um well i go back to the mother infant dyads and bipedalism where uh infants had to either be carried in arms or in uh, baby slings, and uh, mothers would have to uh, put them down occasionally. If they wanted to get anything done, you know that. Any parent will tell you that. That's why you have those baby carriers. And infants around the world, depending on the culture, they 
uh, they'll cry more in cultures where they're not carried in baby slings to a great extent. They do not like to be put down. They want the contact comfort. And what they do is fuss, cry. Human babies cry in advanced ways. You know, crying with tears is a drive mm. thing. So I think the signals to, um, to the caretakers, you know, pick me up, evolve. And I think that voices began to substitute to some extent for arms. That if a mother couldn't, you know, if she had to put her baby down, and I don't mean put it down and leave it and go dig tubers a mile away if you want a baby at the end of the day. I mean, right, you know, right next to her, that um, there, uh, that vocal communications two ways, two ways, reciprocal between infants and mothers. Because what you, ha I think, have to ask first is not how did language evolve? Because we know that today we get our language on the um, uh, coattails of baby talk, mother ease. And so how, how did that emerge? Once you get that, um, eventually, and I think a long way down the road, you'll get the emergence of the first words and then eventually combining them into utterances, et cetera, et cetera. And you can go through the, you know, the development of a baby, it's born, it makes all kinds of noises, it's warming up the pipes, the crying, there are melodies in cries that are pre-babble, eventually you get babbling, eventually those babbles through imitation, baby gets it, you know, baby's just going blah, 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 mama, and one day when it's old enough, the mother goes, mama, did you say mama, that's me, that's me, mama, um, and it's all logical. And I think we can, if we take that from our own understanding of what the only species on this planet that has a real language, grammatical, um, how that develops, and then go back in time and see what scenarios, how can you imagine the beginnings of this emerging from what we, what we know about the environment, about hominids, and about their um, closest cousins when you compare them behaviorally and to some extent genetically. So piecing it together, forming a scenario as a, you know, a hypothesis. Uh, Mother East is universal. It used to be controversial. Some, some anthropologists said, oh, no, there's a society over here. They don't do it. But, uh, but they do. They just maybe have it modified because of certain cultural constraints. Like if you're in a society where eye contact is verboten, well, the baby talk's not going to have, the parentees won't have eye contact, that kind of thing. Yeah. So is there, so that makes some sense that there's like, okay, we're, we, what we needed to do was like, you know, obviously we need to boost, you can't go, from, just like you can't go from um, walking on four legs to just like, oh, I'm going to stand right. up today. Um, right. So too, do we need to like bootstrap language itself? And it sounds yes. like there is a um, your primary hypothesis here is that, yeah, the, the mother ease one of like, hey, there is a, yeah, we start to, when you start to need to set it down and, you know, and uh, these kind of things, you start to, instead of using your arms, say like, it's okay, you can like start talking to it and it's talking to you to kind of like, you know, I want to get picked up now and stuff. And, and that there's like a, and we still have it today. And there's also these like little, we just think of like language, but there's actually a bunch of, you know, um, these toned cries and then the babbles and that those are kind of other like different yeah. forms of, of language. Is there, but I guess a question here is like coming from my third person, pers like looking at the big old list of like how language evolved or whatever. It's like, is the mother thing, is that like, does everybody kind of agree on that? Or like, is there, <laughs> or is this like a you thing, or, you know? <laughs> I don't know, know anything that all anthropologists do. Yeah. Actually, the mother thing I think has, uh, has now a lot of agreement. I think okay, it's. Cool. It um, does have quite a bit of coinage um, among anthropologists, although different anthropologists have their different theories. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, largely because I think of you know of our experience just bearing you know getting our own languages and watching infants get get our own languages around the world yeah. that uh, that it does have some traction. In and is there? Field. Is there, if there was another, I guess the things that are on my mind are like, there's this mother ease thing that's happening, which is like a cre, you know, a crucial precursor. 
And that right. feels, I guess, but there's other stuff that's in my mind of like, okay, but what about imitation? And what about oh, yeah. these kind of spindle neurons that like sure. help us or mere neurons or like, sure. I don't know. So I'm thinking about all those other, uh, in your mind, what are the other crucial things that were happening that helped sure. kicks our language? Okay. You know? Mother Eve, uh, we've been speaking of language. And so we focus on the vocal stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But actually Mother Eve is multifaceted and gestural. There's a lot of body language on the part of both infants and parents. A lot of gesture, uh, things that the comfort, uh, when you comfort an unhappy infant, you don't just soothe it and, oh, or sing to it a lullaby. You might pick it up and mm -hmm. pat it and bounce it or take it for a drive in the car to give it that tactile sense of bouncing along with mommy, I think, mm -hmm. either in a baby sling or prenatally. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think that communication was multifaceted. The whole body gets into it. Language in uh, uh, humans have, you know, vocal communication that's distinct from that of any other animal, including whales and dolphins, in that we produce these little bits of sound and we have rules. Now, we can't recite them, but we've all ingested them. We've all taken them in. So we have rules about how you glue together these pieces of sound to express a word, a phrase, a sentence, an idea. And because, and it's really rapid. And because of that, humans are capable of expressing an infinite number of ideas. And, uh, and we can do that vocally. You can do it visually now because writing was invented not that long ago. But it's transferred, and I think it builds on these ne language networks in the brain, which are vast, which I think drove brain evolution, actually. There's a lot of debate what was the prime mover of hominid brain evolution, and I think it was language because there are vast neurological networks, and you learn your language pretty young, right? But, if you, uh, but you don't learn mathematics that young. You didn't learn to play the violin that young. I think these other sort of advanced uh, cognitive abilities that people have piggybacked to some extent on these distributed networks in the brain, which came out of, uh, originally came out of language. Um, so I see language as, as the main driving thing. Yeah. And, and yeah. the thing about my ideas, I focus on women and their babies, but the babies are both sexes. Mm -hmm. So this is, to an extent, you could say female bias because I think it is mothers. Well, I'm sorry. They're the ones that have the babies and have to keep them alive. But it's really evolved in, you know, the entire lineage. Yeah, no, that's great. Sexes. I think, I, yeah, exactly. I think that there's an interesting, well, one piece that I'm hearing what you're saying is that, yeah, there's a, yeah, that there's like um, the prime uh, a that yeah it wasn't just vocal but it was you know it was um, gestural and all and kind of multimodal and then there's also a sense in which the um, yeah that we have these like uh, that that language was the primary mover of brain development I guess there's like in my mind and correct me if I'm wrong about this but from like when you think about from like you know let's call it 2.5 which is the number in my mind of like okay. this state to like 2.5 million years ago to like you know, 300,000 years ago when we had the massive brain size increase, that that was mostly a, a tool making um, thing as the primary mover. And then after that, it became um, language that like, or, or, or are you saying yeah. that it wasn't tool making, that it was language? Yeah. 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 No, I think it was language. And I think okay, it started great, great. before then. Yeah. And I mean, and again, go back to the development of a human infant. They're born without language. By the time they're six months old, they can hear, they can distinguish every speech sound in the world. They're about 800. By the time they're a year, they no longer can hear most of those. They're pared down to about the 40 on average speech sounds in their language. And all of this is because of incredible brain development that is going on during that first year and, and also um, into the second year of life. And it's, uh, and it's to do a lot of it with perceiving patterns and unconscious statistical processing in order to 
be able to hear and uh, uh, and grasp one's language. Yeah. Yep. So 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 I guess, and I agree. I guess well, maybe we're talking about two different things. I guess when I think about like brain development when one is going from age zero through age two or whatever yeah. is one question and then there's a question of like um size of brain right. from 400 cc's to like you know 1200 right. cc's is that one tools or 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 no <laughs> okay so well the size of the human brain um yeah. vastly increases during those first five years too uh -huh. the human brain okay. yeah uh, he, that's the biggest percentage it's going to grow during its life mm -hmm. it'll level mm -hmm. off to about age 10 and then grow mm -hmm. a little bit more um <laughs> so i'm not quite sure what's the question i guess my question my question is like is in my mind a story that i had to or like my senses of reading random stuff on the internet or whatever in books and stuff was that hey we had um uh, and again these are rough overviews but like we had um at the start of, you know, homo roughly, you know, with homo erectus, et cetera, yeah. um, uh, or homo habilis, whatever, you know, yeah. two, two million years ago, that, that that's when we start to get more of these substantial Ottawa tool industries and stuff. And that that is, I know this is like a tool first perspective, but like, right. this is my understanding. And that those things, and we, we got these tools, the tools had us, um, gave us more energy to give us bigger brains. Yeah. And they also forced, you know, more, bigger brains or whatever. And so we got this reinforcing feedback loop where we got better right. tools, better tools, gave us more energy for bigger brains, better tools. And then before right, long, right. we go from 400 to 1200 cc's or 1500 cc's. Is that a true story or <laughs> no? Um, I'm not so sure. <laughs> okay, great. No, that's great. That's great. That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of archaeologists and cognitive anthropologists think of language as like really recent, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. like when there's cave art has come on. <laughs> and, and I think that there's sort of a tendency to diss, you know, to, to not really consider the extent to which really old hominids in our lineage were developing and were evolving and so i think perhaps they're not given by, by uh by many the um what the appreciation of what what they may have been doing cognitively and again tools are why do we have these wonderful stone tools because they're rocks and they don't perish <laughs> you know <laughs> that's what they, because they're there why did you climb that mountain it's there they're there the rocks. What we don't have is a record of what wasn't there, but there's a pretty good indication from all the ethnography and all the, the comparative primate studies that there would have been lots of tools. They just either weren't yet being modified, you know, rocks that were used as tools like chimps, some chimps will crack nuts, you know, use rocks to crack nuts, but they don't crack the rock. They don't make the rock. But uh, I believe there was probably a you know, vast uh, use of tools from natural materials way before those, those first rocks. Yeah, yeah. And, and that and, also and it there... may have been that, um, that and, I, and I see language developing slowly, but really starting really early and, and evolving over time, which it still is. I mean, languages are changing all the time. And so making those, and some of the stone tools end up being gorgeous as you come more and more, you know, forward in time. But um, I think that that well could have been, you know, piggybacking also on, on these neurological networks, which basically were sequ sequential and analytical and logical in the service of, you know, creating this whole complex way of being able to think any idea and piggybacking on those and applying it to putting some of those ideas you know into fruition yeah yeah no that's great so so yeah what i'm hearing is yeah it's like the kind of the it's a, it's a classic thing where it's like the simple you could imagine a simple version of the story which is just yeah the oh from you know 2.5 or 2 million years ago to you know like 700,000 or to, let's call it 200,000 years ago the brains got bigger because of the tools and blah blah, blah. and yeah, then yeah. um after that we got um these you know modern modern humans started you know whatever 50,000 60,000 years that's kind of when you can really think of language starting blah blah, blah. Yeah. but actually there's a more complicated story there which is that um, the tools were obvious, the stone tools were important, but there was also wood tools and there was also language and versions of, uh, motheries and other versions of language that were happening around that time with certain kind of brain structure and stuff. So that, that all makes a lot of sense to me. I think there's a, maybe as we get into rap mode here, the first question that I have is 
So how, when you think about applying these ideas and like, you know, understanding our evolution as, um, as you know, from, you know, chimps and early hominids, all that to like, how do you apply that? How do you think about the applications of that to modern day? Like, why should we care? Well, I care just out of curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the nice things about being an academic is, you know, you can make your living by studying ideas and, and interacting with students who, um, who are interested in these ideas. So um, in terms of applying it to the future, I do think about the future, but not so much in the terms we've been talking about, which have been like origins. How did we get, where did we come from? How did we end up being the way we are today? But I'm interested in, well, where are we going with these brains and what's the future? And, um, and to me, it's a big question of how much of a future do we have because of some of the things our big, beautiful brains have invented in terms of weaponry. And, uh, and so I, I don't know how long we will continue to exist. I do think that the brain is still evolving. I do think you get natural selection going on in different communities, which uh, affects the kinds of brains that are going into the future. I've, you know, I've uh, studied Asperger's syndrome a lot, and people with the syndrome often are just brilliant scientists. They're geeks, and I mean that in the most complimentary sense. And you'll find tech industries just full of them. And you can have this is Simon Baron Cohn who suggested you have certain enclaves. Um, where you'll have men and women who are techies meeting up. They have, you know, uh, they have very high functioning autism. They reproduce. And so you get higher frequencies of Asperger's syndrome in these communities. And it's a kind of selection that's going on in, it's kind of a micro selection in some communities. And I think as we become, as societies become more and more dependent on technology, I can see these frequencies increasing and that things looking a lot different 5,000 years from now, assuming there is a 5,000 years from now than today. If you look back 5,000 years ago, we barely have reading. That's when it emerged, amazingly. And that was a huge revolution. If you look back 50 years ago, you're starting to get into the next revolution, computers. And now, who knows with the quantum age. So I do think about um, the future and things are accelerating cognitively and in terms of what that cognition is doing and how it will be used. And let's not even begin to talk about politics. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We don't talk about politics on the show. No. Yeah, yeah, great. Exactly. That's great. That's, um, um, uh, um, yeah, I think a, that's a, yeah, that's a really cool perspective on, and I'm, I'm in San Francisco and I would say, I remember going to therapy when I was, you know, 26, or whatever, I'm 31 now. And I was like asking people about like, I was like asking my therapist, I was like, do I have do I have autism, Asper? And she was like, not really, probably, like maybe like 5%. Like, it's like, you're either super, like for all intents and purposes, you're just like a normal guy who likes science crap. But um, the, um, um, but but a lot of my friends are are on the spectrum in various ways. And so, yeah, yeah they're they're mating with each other. They're out there mating. So it's- um, That's it's, right. Uh, and, and there are, um, they're very, there are genetic components, but they're not simple. There's not like a gene. Mm -hmm. It's additive and there's hundreds of genes that can be involved in it. So it's complicated. But if you get, you know, that, that groups pairing off and reproducing. You're going to get more. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's funny. Um, and then I have about one final question here, which is we're going to do a little round of this, what's, what's overrated and, and underrated. And so I'm going to just say a thing and then you're going to say whether that thing is overrated or underrated okay. in, in like 30 seconds. So it's like a very short thing where you have to give okay. you like your, your hot take. Um, Okay, what do you think about like fire in human history? Um, okay, that's complicated. I think it's important but not understood. So I don't think it's overrated. I think it's misunderstood. Past. <laughs> how how is it? How is it? Um, so you think it's kind of? I guess yeah. Or in which way is it uh, misunderstood? <laughs> You can answer a little uh, bit further now. We don't, know, we don't know when it started. Mm -hmm. 
and the evidence is conflicting and it's um, relatively recent, I think, com the, the deliberately making of fire, not the capturing fire and, and trying to keep, keep it, the embers glowing. Um, so I think it's not yet, we don't really have a bead on it yet. Was it important? Certainly, certainly. So uh, I don't think that can be overrated, but the question of when. Got it. And, okay, so it sounds like it's in, in its role is um, the question of when is the misunderstood piece and then the question of, um, yeah, you think it's relatively either underrated or whatever from like its importance in the in the journey of, of, of early um, hominids. Okay, great. What about what about being in groups? How, is that overrated? Uh, like the importance of being in groups in, in terms of our evolutionary history, is that overrated or underrated? Um, no, oh God, you know, it depends on, <laughs> I'm not going to be good at this because you have some people that overrate it that say it was all about groups and social living and some people that underrate it. So if I had to choose, I would say overrated, but still really, really important. <laughs> nice. Great. Exactly. That's it. That's an allowed answer. Um, beautiful. Well, with that, um, everybody, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show, Dean. If folks want to check out Dean's work, it is, yeah, she's done a bunch of great work on, I'm just thinking about some of the books that she's written around like Finding Our Tongues, which is all about motherese. And then, you know, the, some of the recent ones about um, the Asperger stuff, Geeks, Genes, and the Evolution of Asperger Syndrome. Um, and then, yeah, she's in route to writing this current book on the botanical age. So we'll be excited to, or the botanic age. Um, so we'll be excited to like read about that and understand the role of, uh, you know, baby slings and wood tools um, at that time. So definitely check out, um, feel free to check out any of her books if you want to go deeper on any of these subjects. Is there anything else that you want to say, Dean, to our listeners? No, but it's been really fun talking to you. I've enjoyed every minute. Me too. Um, yeah, and I've learned good things. I've 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 re-updated away a little bit from stone, the Stone Age, and the importance of stone of, of tools in brain size, and so that's been helpful. Um, well, thank you so much, Dean, and thank you everybody for listening. Goodbye. Thanks so much for listening today. If you like the show, please give us a five-star podcast review or subscribe on YouTube. And if you'd like to chat about this episode with a community of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Reese Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks and see you here for the next episode. Bye.